Okay, let's wait one more minute. We're waiting to see if Yao's here. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. All right, so let's get started. So guys, welcome to uh, E451, 551, Wind Energy. Uh, I think uh, I know most of the people in this class, so good to see folks again. All right, so uh, for those who you don't know me, my name is Belson, and uh, for this class, I'll have my office hours on Fridays from 3.30 to 4.30. You're also welcome to send me an email to schedule other times to meet. So, uh, so our TA is Yao. So Yao, can you say a few words about yourself? You can introduce yourself to the class. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in electrical and computer engineering department. And I'm very glad to be TA for this course. My office hour is 3 to 4 p.m. And the Zoom link is posted on the uh, class website. Okay, yeah, thanks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so please, you know, when you have questions about the homework or the class, you know, you can feel free to email both Yao and me. So y'all may respond a bit quicker than I do. So, so basically, this today's lecture will go through some of the logistics of the class. Then we'll get into some of the technical part, basically looking at wind turbines. And so for the first you know, 30 minutes, we'll go through logistics. So first off, you know, there's no required textbook. Okay, so in the past, we have required this textbook. For this quarter, we'll not require a textbook. Okay, so you have access to the textbook, to this book. You're welcome to use it. Right? You're welcome to refer to the book, but it's not required. And the reason we don't require this book is there's a lot of books within this book. And uh, unfortunately, Professor so Muhammad Ashra Kelly, who was a professor in our department, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years back. So there's you no know, unlikely we can correct the bugs in the book. So now we're basically uh, to avoid having to correct the textbook all the time, we will make the notes, basically the slides I post will be the reference for us. You can use the book for the information, but know that there's a lot of uh, bugs in the book. Okay, you'll find some equations that doesn't make sense. You'll find some things that are wrong. So you're welcome to use a book as a source for exercise. You're welcome to use a book for background reading, but we will not be referring to the equations in the book right, to avoid confusion, to avoid some of the bugs showing up. Okay. Uh, yeah, if any questions, just shout out, let me know. So for other resources, right? So if you take in 554, these are the books we have using 554. So these are you know, general power system books you're welcome to use and refer to. Again, we don't require them, right? The, the lecture slides will be self-contained, but uh, referring to these can be helpful, can be helpful for us. So the website, so again, the website is a public website. Right, so all the announcement, all the lecture slides, the recorded videos, the homework assignments, be on this public website. We will see Canvas site mostly for grading and homework submission. Right, so you know, it'll be if you take other classes from me, it will be very similar to those other classes. So grading, our grading will be forty percent homework. 30% midterm, 30% finals. Okay, so, you know, basically the midterm and the final are given equal weight because again, this class is a little bit, uh, the material is a little bit all over the place, right? So it's a wide range of material. As you'll see later in today's lecture, we'll cover everything from you know, how does airfoils work to storage technology. So some of them may not linearly depend on each other. So we'll be looking at you know broad range of topics in both in wind energy and renewable integration. So the final and midterm you know are not building on top of one another. So both are thirty percent. 
will have weekly homeworks and now make 40% of the final grade. Okay, so this will be the same for the people who's taking 451 as well as 551, right? So the graduate class and the undergrad class will do the same exams, will not be all that different. For the homeworks, there'll be some questions in the homework that's uh, designated for the graduate students. Uh, some questions will be more open-ended and those will be required for the people who's taking 551. I'll act like bonus questions for the folks who's taking uh, 451. So any questions about the grading, the structure? Okay, so, and of course we don't know what will happen in this quarter with COVID stuff. So if there are adjustments to be made, we'll make adjustments related to COVID as well. Okay, so, so that, you know, we'll do on the fly. But again, the key is to you know, communicate with me. Right, so if you have, you know, some issues or uh, you have some circumstances you want me to know about that will impact your grade, uh, feel free to uh, talk to me. Right? So we, we're fairly flexible in these times, but the, the key is again, communication, right? advanced communication. Okay, so the policy, so the policy for the exams will be, you know, both will be remote, probably be all day long. So, you know, looking at uh, maybe 12 hour take home exams will be remote, will be take home, will be open to whatever technology you can think of. So we welcome, you feel free to Google stuff, feel free to use software, uh, you can use other books, you can look at whatever you want, as long as there's no communication between each other, right? As long as there's no communication between you know, the students, all other technologies are fine. Okay, and uh, so the exams being take home does not mean you need 12 hours to do it. Let's make it a bit easier since we have people all around the world in different time zones. So it'll be easier to make it just uh, take home and, all, and the 12 hour long exams. So the midterm will probably be middle of February, middle of February. Uh, final is whatever the final time is set by the university. And then for homeworks, you know, Feel free to talk among yourselves. Feel free to discuss with everybody. But again, you know, as you should write your own solutions, right? Yep. Fact that your solutions is your own. But the uh, you know discussion is fine. Uh, who's not muted? I'm getting some interesting background noises on the call. Okay, right, okay. So any questions with the exam and homework policies? So I don't know the date for the midterm yet. I suspect, you know, we'll set a date closer to the midterm time. Yeah. Okay, so this is exams. So programming, so you, you're, there'll be some problems that's easier if you have access to something like MATLAB or Python. Uh, there's no programming questions per se, right? You don't need to write a script in this class. But you'll see questions with you know large matrices. The matrix that has four or five dimensional, uh, four or five, sorry, four by four, five by five matrices. You may have to invert this matrices. So as expected, you know how to do it using some program. Okay. So uh, I think y'all will debug Python. <laughs> so we'll debug Python. If you use Python, we'll debug it. And uh, otherwise, you know, you're welcome to use whatever program you want to use. Okay, so again, since everything's remote, there's no need to restrict ourselves to questions that you can do with a calculator. So we'll see larger scale questions compared to previous classes. But in previous classes, we may have considered, you know, one turbine now gives us the freedom to consider many turbines together. Right, in a matrix formation. Yeah, so you expect some kind of questions that do require you to use a computer to figure out the answer. Okay. But there's no programming, right? There's no programming in the programming sense. Okay, okay so prerequisites, prerequisites, right? So basically the only prerequisite for this class is 351. So if you have taken 351, 
you are fine with this class. I think all of you have done that, right? So as long as you come through 51, you have you know enough to take this class. We don't we do not require the material cover, for example, in 454. We don't require that. We'll look at something like we'll look a little bit at power system analysis, but we'll look at from a renewable integration point of view. Yeah, so it will not be a repeat of 454 and will be sort of very different than 454. Okay, so as long as you know you know 351, you're somewhat up to date on 351, then it's okay. You have enough background to take this class. All right, so any questions about this course logistics? Issue about logistics. Okay, all right, so all that is logistics. So what do we want to get out of this class, right? What, what do we want at the end of the day after we take this class, uh, you know, what do we expect to learn from this class? So the idea from this class is, one is we want to know the mechanics of how do we transfer mechanical energy from containing wind movement of air to electrical energy, to current and voltage. Okay, so this is the first part, sorry, the first major part of the class is, given we have some energy moving air, right, half mv squared, how does that show up as a current, as the output of the turbine? Right? How do we make that transformation? How do we translate energy in that sense? The second is, you know, we want to have a basic idea of where it is good to install wind turbines, where it's bad to install wind turbines. Okay, so we'll have some intuitive idea. If you look at a map, where do you think it makes sense to install turbines, or maybe it doesn't make sense to install turbines. So this we want some having some intuitive understanding. And then we want to understand if you have a wind turbine, what does it mean for the bigger system? What does it mean for the grid? Okay, and with this is we'll look at both wind and solar. Okay, we'll treat both wind and solar here. So the class is called wind energy because it turns out very hard to change the name of a class. But for this part, we'll look both at wind and solar equivalently. Because the reason, you know, the there the difference between wind and solar to conventional generation as they're random, right? you have randomness. So look at, you know, how do we deal with randomness? How do we allocate resources when there's randomness? Right? So how do we think, you know, instead of thinking, I have 10 megawatt of load, I have 10 megawatt of generation, generation equals load. How do we think about have 10 megawatt load, 20 megawatt generation, that's on half the time. But how do we think about those kind of questions, right? So, We'll look at the physics of you know, wind power generation. Then we'll think about the grid integration. We'll think about what happens. You put this sort of random resources into the system. And the big thing we want, the new thing we want to do this quarter is one want emphasis storage. Okay, one emphasis storage. So it turns out there is really not a good course about energy storage at UW yet, at least the system aspect of energy storage. So the last uh, two weeks or a week and a half, we hope in this class, uh, we'll focus on how energy storage comes into play in the system. Okay, so what we want to do is instead of looking at, you know, how do you design a highly efficient battery? What we want to do is if I put a battery into the system with this kind of efficiency, with this kind of degradation, what does it mean for the rest of system operations? Okay, to integrate, 10 megawatt of wind, how much battery do we need? Right? What kind of power capacity, what kind of energy capacity? How do we think about the cost? Okay, so this is what we want covering the class as uh, different than previous years. So what we'll do is we'll de-emphasize, we'll de-emphasize the, some of the physics of wind power generation. Okay, so we'll go less into detail about that. Okay, so for folks, we'll, let's go, we'll go less into detail about electrical machines. As for folks who you know very interesting how machines work, uh, my, my apologies, we will not go into that much detail about machines. 
Well, instead, of take that week of time and talk about energy storage. Okay, so that's the plan of the class, right? So any uh, issues, comments about the plan? Okay, right, so yeah. So the really trade-off you compare to previous years is we're trading off very detailed machine models with more time carving energy storage, right? So that's where we say, you no know, week from machines, we'll put that into storage. All right, so then if you look at the topics a little bit more in detail, so we'll do an overview, we'll do a very fast overview of the topics. Uh, look at, you know, a little bit more in detail what we'll cover. So, right, so we look at wind power generation. Basically, wind power generation is, you know, the generator is different than a conventional generator, it's powered by moving air. After that, from a physical infrastructure sense, it's very similar to how a you know, conventional generator works. You have a generator here, you have some gearbox, you have some power electronics, then this goes to the grid. Okay. So once we figure out how the physics of power generation works, then it's not much different. Then after the turbine, if you look at turbine you know, as a point connecting the grid, then the rest of the grid to the customers looks fairly uh, conventional. It's the same grid. It's an AC grid, uh, you know, the generator, one turbo access the generator, power flows to the customers. And so this is a fairly uh, standard grid after the generators. So the physics of wind power generation is mainly driven by the aerodynamics of the wind turbine. So we have some blades on the wind turbine. And uh, when air moves across the blade, you generate a lift that turns the turbine and that produces energy. Okay, so this is, we'll cover a little bit of aerodynamic theory. Uh, this is not different than the, how an airplane flies. Okay, so we'll do a very, uh, we'll, we'll go into, we'll, you know, we'll do a sort of a overview, we'll do a sort of, very top level overview of, when, of how airfoil works, right? How airfoil works. And now we'll translate to something called a coefficient of performance. So this is really efficiency. Okay, this is the efficiency. So what we mean by efficiency is if you look at a mass of moving air, the kinetic energy in that air is half mv squared. Right, sort of the amount of air I have times the uh, speed, times the square of the velocity of the air. Of course, there's no hope to extract all of that energy into electric power. Okay, so there, we are not gonna get 100% of all that. But we'll get some fraction of that energy into electrical energy. Okay, so, that is, so that basically will summarize that using a, something called a coefficient of performance. So instead of doing all the analysis to compute what this coefficient is, we'll understand where this inefficiencies come from and then how is this summarized as a number, okay? So we'll say a wind turbine is 30% efficient. Why is it 30% efficient? Is this good or bad for a wind turbine? Can we change the efficiency? And these are the questions we want to answer. So all that will be captured. So we'll look at you know, how much power is there in the air and uh, how much power we can extract out of, you know, how much power we can get out of it. So that will be the coefficient of performance, the efficiency of the turbine, right? Now we'll look at the separation. So this is when we have multiple turbines. So because turbulence, we cannot place them too close to each other. So we'll look at how far they have to be. And uh, so given a area, how many turbines we can put there. And the reasons of, we got some ballpark estimate, you know, given the size of the turbine, how far does the rest of the turbine have to be from that one? Okay, so these are, this is the mechanics of uh, wind power generation. Then we'll look at the statistics, right? When we said there's randomness in power generation, 
that means we have look at the probability. Okay, so instead of generating again, say five megawatts, you we'll think about generating something of a distribution, maybe centered at five megawatts. Okay, so all this will be uh, we'll look we'll think we'll try to think about the problem in a probabilistic sense. Okay, so to get a sense, who here has not taken probability? If you in the chat, raise your hand or say out loud. Who has never heard a word random variable? Who doesn't know what it is? I didn't. I didn't take mm -hmm. any probability class. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So the right. So it's basically here we'll do probability from the ground up. So I will not assume any prior knowledge of probability. I will assume you know things like. Uh, you know, calculus, things like that. I will now assume prior knowledge probability. So we'll look at probability, but in a sense of how do we think of wind and solar, right? Just these resources probabilistically. Uh, the big part of the class is to give you this kind of thinking ability. Turns out it's really different. If you think about the them deterministically versus thinking about them when they have uncertainty, it's quite different the mindset we have to have. So this class will to convey to you that how do you, at least how do you, in your, in your head, how do you think about it, right? So maybe not the hardcore analysis you would do in a probability class, but at least how to think about this type of problems. So then we'll look uh, inside the turbine. By inside the turbine, we mean we'll look at the generators basically. Right, so inside the wind turbine is basically a big machine, an electric machine. And uh, you know, there's two ways of two types of machines: an induction generator, induction machine, and a synchronous generator, synchronous machine. Okay, so we'll we'll take a look at to know, you know when as induction, when as induction generator used, when is a synchronous generator used. Uh, why do we prefer one compared to the other? And how do we build the systems around this generator? Right? How do we build a system around this technology? Okay. So to do a review right, of 351, so 351, we covered both of uh, these technologies. So for you guys, when do you think we'll prefer to use an induction generator? Or let's take a step back. What's the difference between induction generator and a synchronous generator? What's the difference between these two generators? Um, there's no electrical connection to the stator for the induction. Okay, so then what's the implication of that? So maybe you'd want to use that for offshore wind since it's in the water. No, that's, 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 that's fairly secondary. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So from a generator perspective, what's the difference I said between a induction and a synchronous generator? So which one are e is easier to build? Which one is cheaper? Induction, right? So why is the induction generator cheaper? Induction generator is cheaper because it's very simple to construct. For induction generator, you there is basically what you do is there's a outside frequency, outside speed, there's a synchronous speed. And you generate the power by an offset from the synchronous speed. Right? So remember we're carving 351. Right? We have a omega s and we have omega of the generator. When the generator, let's say, right, if there's a difference between the two speed, we get power from the induction generator. Right? So induction generator is very robust very easy to build, fairly cheap. Okay, whereas a synchronous generator requires its own magnet, requires its own speed. A synchronous generator establishes its own speed. So it's sort of bulkier, it's more expensive, it's heavier to build. Okay, so these are the differences. So, but then if you look at induction generator, when might you not want to use the induction generator for wind? Uh, it's a very robust, right? Induction generator is super robust. Uh, it's very, it's sort of cheap. Uh, it's fairly light, actually. There's not much 
things going on in the machine. But maybe what are some of the drawbacks of induction generators? Does it have to do with limiting the, uh, the rotational speed or anything? Uh, right, right. So one is it's hard to establish asynchronous speed. You need gearboxes, basically. You have this one that's rotating at whatever the speed, you know, one wants to rotate, whatever the speed is decided by what the turbine speed. You have a synchronous speed, so you need gearbox to do this, right? You have to synchronous speed. So gearbox is a big challenge. What is another challenge with induction generator having to do with reactive power? Can an induction generator generate reactive power? Can it generate reactive power? Okay, so it turns out if you remember the circuit diagram for induction generator it cannot generate reactive power. Okay, so if you have forgotten about this, it's okay. We'll look at the circuit again. But in a, it just happens cannot generate reactive power, which is something you might want from a synchronous generator, or you may want from a generator, which is to provide reactive power. Okay, so that means a trade-off as induction generator is cheaper, a synchronous generator uh, has better performance. It does not need an outside synchronous speed. It can generate reactive power you wanted to. The trade-off is just a more complicated, more expensive machine. Okay. So in this class, we'll look at both. Okay, we'll look at how both works. We'll look at the difference. We'll look at when you might want to use an induction generator versus synchronous generator. Okay. So these are the idea we to look at. Okay, so you now if you have forgotten all about this, uh, maybe useful to just review 351 for a little bit. I should remind yourself all this for machines. Okay. Then after that, we'll look at power system operations. Right, so balancing supply and demand, uh, especially when you have uncertainty in the system. But we'll say much more about this. We'll look at you know what how do you use storage, or how do we think about storage? How do we how does storage make money? For example, can we make money by putting storage in when there's a lot of wind and solar? Okay. All right. So we'll you now we'll think about we'll look at storage. So for us, storage will be just this box that can you know take can store energy and has some efficiency. So this will be our model for a battery. And our goal will be to, to think about what happens when we put in a battery. Essentially, we have randomness coming into the grid. There's two ways to deal with it. One is in algorithm sense, right? Plan better for the randomness. Another is putting batteries. So we'll think about how both of these uh, tools deal with the randomness we'll have coming to the grid from one. Okay. So this was storage. Right, so the reason when you storage and all that is again, you just when there's a lot of randomness in our system, right? So there's quite a bit of randomness in our system. Okay, so how do we get to the, how do we deal with the randomness? Okay. So again, in summary, basically we're gonna think about this class will concentrate on one. Here, right, we'll think about the, how one works from the generation side. In the transmission side, we'll think about wind and solar. Okay, we'll think about how wind and solar impact transmission. We'll not talk very much about load. Okay, we'll still assume load is what it is. Okay, so load is some given value. Uh, our randomness comes in the supply side and uh, we have different tools to deal with randomness in the supply side. Any questions for this sort of summary or this overview of the class? Okay, yeah, so you know, if you have questions, please ask. Otherwise, it gets quite boring looking at the screen, looking at Zoom. So if you have questions, please ask. Right, so if not, let's go on, right? So again, a great part of this class, we basically doing the following. We'll take a wind turbine. Right, so that's, this is my drawing of a wind turbine. 
Our goal is to take this wind turbine to convert it to some circuit like this. Okay, this is our goal. Okay, so a big part of the class is give it a turbine. I want to make it. I want to make it look like this. Okay, we want to put it into a RLC circuit. Once we put into an RLC circuit, what we can do is then to use circuit analysis to understand you know, how this turbine works, compute the power, deliver and things like this. Okay, so whenever we see we do some calculations in this class, you know, keeping in mind that most of the time we're trying to get a circuit representation. Okay, so when we have induction motor, we want to equivalent circuit of induction mode. We have a synchronous machine, we want the equivalent circuit of a synchronous machine. Right, so our goal is almost always get to a circuit, then analyze the circuit, then come back to see you know, the quantities we're analyzing the circuit. Let's see physically how does that manifest in my turbine. Okay, so the goal is to you know, get a circuit model, do some calculations, then come back and see you know, what does the number mean we get from the physical model. All right, so then to get to the circuit, right? So we'll look at things like, uh, so this is mostly for us to standardize notation, right? So we'll talk power, right? So you hear in this class, you'll see a lot of power. So power is energy per time, energy over time, which is watts, right? So it's volt amp, it's power. So this is standard for us. So you, in this class, you not see the unit watt a lot. Because it's unlikely you see the unit watt. Or most of the time you won't see watt. What you'll see is things like kilowatt. So this is 10 to the three watts or megawatts. You'll see this is 10 to the six watt. Okay, so these are the numbers you'll see most of the time, right? So, okay, so for some context, Right, so how much is a lot of power? So each household consumes about one kilowatt of power, give or take, right? give or take. So one kilowatt of power is one household. This obviously changes from time to time. So for example, a hair dryer will consume by itself about two kilowatts. But whereas if, you know, if all you're doing at home is browsing your phone, your home may consume 100 watts. So a kilowatt is a you know, good, uh, reasonable order of magnitude estimate, how much power we consume. Then the um, all, overall together, the US is about half a terawatt of power on average. Right, so fairly sizable system, half a terawatt, the US. So put this in context of, yeah, so this one kilowatt is, per time, right? So kilowatt is per second. So this is true per second. So power at any time on average, one of us is consuming one kilowatt. So this is not energy. This is not energy. You multiply this by number of hours in a year, we get kilowatt hour. Right? So here we're talking just by the per time measurement of power. So I'll put this into context for wind, let's see. So given a wind turbine, what do you guys think the power range, power capacity for wind turbine is. Knowing that a household is kilowatt and the entire US is 500 gigawatts. What is a reasonable size wind turbine? Okay, so chess us one to a megawatt, which is not too bad of a guess. So a wind turbine nowadays, Okay, so there are a lot of small wind turbines constructed in you know, the decades before. But nowadays, most wind turbines are 1 megawatt, or let's say 0.5, to the largest is around 15 megawatts. And so very large, pretty large. Right? 15 megawatt wind turbine is not a small machine. It's not a small machine. Right, so wind turbines nowadays are fairly big generators. They're, they're not small things. And the uh, 50 megawatt wind turbines are really, really large. 
So a 50 megawatt turbine will have the size of, so if you look at it, it's probably a little bit bigger than the Space Needle, actually. So these are big, big machines. These are not small machines. Okay, so of course, these fit on the very large wind turbines are offshore turbines, but these are big machines. Okay, so sometimes our calculation will have to do with the fact that there's a physical size limitation. Okay, so there's not, both from electrical power standpoint and can you build a turbine that large? Okay, we'll, we'll deal with this kind of questions. Okay. So this is power, right? So so energy, right, is very different than power. Right? Energy is very different than power. Energy is basically is the integration of power over time. Right? So if you integrate power over time, you get energy, you get energy. Right? So, uh, so when we pay our electricity bills, do we pay for power or do we pay for energy? So this is actually a trick question. The answer is we pay for both, we pay for both. Right, so the variable amount, right, so you look at your bill, there's two parts to it. One part, one part is the fixed cost, meaning the cost of building the lines. That has to do with power. The lines are constructed to deliver, the, to handle the peak power demands. So that's a power, that's cost associated with power. Another part is how much energy you have used, right? So when you actually, you know, we actually do work, right? In the physics sense, you use energy, okay? So that's the energy you use. But when you pay, you pay for both. In this class, again, we'll look at both measures. So both power and energy are important for wind turbine design for renewables, okay? We want something that has, you know, high capacity, a lot of power capacity but also high energy output, but also something that's, you know, power integrated over time is also high. Okay, we, want, we will look at both aspects of the problem. Okay, so pa both power and energy are important. Okay, so again, the, here we, I want to say, you know, why is when the integration uh, non-trivial, right? Why is it non-trivial? Part of the challenge from building a turbine itself, but a lot of the other challenges come from the fact that the turbine has to sit in a large system, right? So we have all seen this picture of the grid. So this is around miles of lines. We have about 19, Generators, so these generators are the large generators. So these are definitely about one megawatt generators. And then we have 120 million loads. Okay, we have a lot more loads. Right? So we have a lot of loads. Right? So this system is quite difficult to manage, quite difficult to work, to you know, keep the system running as not trivial. And the, uh, the thing is to manage capacity, things go wrong all the time in a grid that large. Okay, when you have 19,000 generators, some of them will not be running at each time. And when you have 19,000 things, we have, you know, 500,000 miles of line, something goes wrong all the time in the system. Okay. So we build some redundancy into the system. So if you take in, you know, 454, this means any one component fails, the grid has to run. Right? So that we'll build some redundancy into the system. The thing is, we're not quite too sure what to do when wind comes into it. Okay? So wind and solar makes managing the grid more challenging and more interesting. Right? They really make things interesting when we manage the grid when we have wind and solar. Okay? Right? Because you know, both wind and solar, they are, intermittent, okay? meaning that they're not on all the time. They're intermittent. 
right? They're stochastic, meaning that it's hard to predict. Okay. So if it's intermittent, but easy to forecast, then we are good at dealing with this. Right? So if you remember three, two, three years ago, there was a solar eclipse, right? And uh, the worry was, you know, if a solar eclipse happens, what happened to the solar power generation? Because that event is so predictable, it's not hard to deal with that event. Okay, that, that's, that's quite easy. The interesting thing comes when this both intermittent is not on all the time and it's hard to predict when it's stochastic. Right? When both factors come together, it's hard to deal with, you know, hard to think about what happens. Then we have other issues, things like economics. Right, economics means, you know, how do we make money? Right, so how do we, if you go and build a wind turbine or a solar panel, how much money can you make? Right, how should we price this? How should we, you know, at the end of the day, some money has exchanged hand. How do we do that? And then we have always have the technical aspect of it. This means, you know, engineering wise, how do we, uh, deal with this fact as uncertain, or how do we think about, how do we integrate paying the grid, paying the resources, and uh, you know, how, how do we think about this kind of thing? Okay. So all these aspects coming to make things more interesting. And the one good example is if you look at the BPA system. So BPA means Bonneville Power Authority. Essentially means uh, Oregon and Washington. This means Oregon and Washington. The things to note are this green line. Okay, so this is wood. Okay, this is wood. And this is not a very good power choice for wood. Because what happened with this one is over two days, over three days, it's a significant part of the generation mix. However, over the rest of the week, there are almost no wood. Okay, and this is actual choice. This is actual choice of wood. Okay, so this is the SCADA system reading we have. Okay. So this gives idea of how random wind can be. Right? So when, you know, here over three days went to over 4,000 you know, 4, megawatts. But then for the rest of the time, there are essentially no wood. How do we think about this kind of resources? Do you call this lot of wind? You know, do you just average out this over time or how do we think about this? Right, so that's one thing we'll look at in class. Right? Given some resource like this, how do we, how does the system work? How do we put storage into the system to mitigate this kind of problems? And the another thing was when uh, this is just, the wind is very hard to predict. So this is uh, some choices about wind patterns. So this is wind speed in meters per second. This is power in megawatt. So this is for a farm. That's for a farm with multiple wind turbines. Okay, so this is, so speed goes up and down, power goes up and down. But if you look at this kind of choice, this kind of graph, what this tells you is Predicting this thing with any sort of accuracy is very challenging. So, you know, it's not the, uh, so if any of you come up with some amazing uh, ways to predict wind power generation, let's say a day in advance, you'll make a lot of money. <laughs> There's plenty of startups, plenty of people, plenty of companies, government agencies try to predict wind. It's just hard it because it looks something like this. Yeah, so yeah. this is not, I mean, it's this full dynamic range, sometimes zero, sometimes the cap, and can be anything in between. And it changes very quickly. And it's not always that correlated with the raw speed measurement. Yeah, so not easy to predict. And uh, in this class, we'll look at how do we think about, you know, the, this sort of uncertainty, high uncertainty in one prediction. Right, so, you know, why wind and solar? So if you're taking this class, you know, you don't need to be convinced, right? Sustainability is important. And uh, 
also clean energy is quite robust, quite robust, actually as an industry. So this is three newspaper titles. So this is in 2017, this is in 2020, this is of course 2020. So what happens is, you know, for the last four years, really clean energy is actually booming. Now, regardless of whatever political climate we may be in, it's doing quite well. And interestingly, one sector of the economy that grew, grew a lot during the pandemic is actually renewable power generation. So it turns out, you know, even though our GDP shrink by something like, I don't know, 20, 30, 20% in one quarter, renewable power grew steadily all throughout 2020. And so it's fairly robust to all kinds of, you know, external factors that will not go away. Right? It looks like it will not go away. And, uh, you know, it's, they are coming no matter what. And our goal is to figure out, from, you know, from engineering perspective, how do we integrate wind and solar? Right? How do we integrate wind and solar? So if, you know, if you, right, so, and if some of you may go on work utility, you have to deal with wind and solar. Some of you may go and work for, you may have your own companies. And uh, there's a lot of uh, activity in the clean energy space to form new companies, right? You, some of you may be you know, having new startups working on this kind of integration issues. Okay? So it's quite a active field, which is a great thing for us. So if you look at wind production in 2015, then wind is really concentrated in you know where you think wind is concentrated. That's not a very surprising map. We have a lot of wind all throughout the West Coast has a lot of wind. A lot of wind is in Texas. Okay, so this is 17. Right? So Texas by far has most of has most wind in the US. It really is the state with most of wind, with most wind. Then the also Midwest has a lot of wind and the sort of the Eastern seaboard has a lot of wind. So there's the wind distribution. Uh, a lot of wind is not where the people are, where cities are. So a challenge, you know, we'll look at one challenge is if you need to transmit wind power through a long distance, what's the implication of that? Basically, how do we deal with voltage issues? we want to transmit wind through a long distance. And now we'll tie us back to the pilotronics. We'll look at some pilotronics in this class. Okay. So if you look at renewable goals, right? So how does wind play a role with all the goals we have for renewables? Well, so renewables, so there are all kinds of different targets we want to get to for renewables. So on the left-hand side, these are the percentage of power generated by renewable resources, essential power. So some of these are targets. Okay, some of these are actually numbers, some of these are targets, right? So where we are is we have done the easy part. So going, you know, roughly to 20, 25%, this is roughly done. Okay, we can make it 20% relatively easily, right? There's no major technical challenges. Rest of this is hard. We don't know how to go from 25 to 50 percent. Okay. This uh, you know much, much harder. How do we increase that? We really don't know. Once we co-op harder. So this class in your mind, think about it, right? So we're learning wind energy, we're learning renewable integration. Okay. Think about you know, if our goal is to get to let's say deep decarbonization, which is 80 percent renewables, how do we get there? Right. What are some of the challenges? What are some of the strategies you can think of? Uh, if you see a turbine design, you can you think you can improve it? You know, by all means, you know, go for it. Right? By all means, you know, uh, talk about it in the class. Right. So these, our goal is really try to say, you know, how do we answer these question marks? Right. I, I don't have a good idea, but this course is a start. So again, if you look at the transmission system, right, we always need to deal with the fact that, you know, wind is not really, you know, where the people, right, we have to transmit how. Okay, right? So for Washington state, there's a lot of wind, there's a lot of offshore wind or even onshore wind, the other sides of the mountain. 
But how do we get that to Seattle is by no means trivial. Right? So these are some issues to think about. And then, so the summary is, right? So a redo of the grid is unlikely, unlikely to happen. We're stuck with the grid we have. And the better operations will be to accommodate, you know, stochastics. Right? How, how do we, to design better turbines, to have a better algorithm to be more storage, to deal with, to mitigate the fact that wind is uncertain. Okay? So here in this class, let's take a break. Let's take a break now for 10 minutes. We'll come back at 1.30. Then for the rest, we'll really look, we'll go into more technical things about the sort of power generation from moving air. Right? We'll look at how aerodynamics works. Okay. So what uh, have any questions, welcome to ask. Otherwise, we'll resume class at 1.30. Is there a prediction of the demand? Okay, all right, so let's come back to the class. So uh, there are two questions in chat during the break. One is, do we predict when energy, demand for wind energy will continue to rise in the future years? Yes, so that's absolutely what the prediction is. Right? We expect wind energy will take up a, you know, even larger fraction of the generation mix. Right, so all the trend is pointing toward that. We're building you know, larger turbines. We're getting better at constructing turbines. We're getting better at integrating wind. So we're likely we'll have more wind. Other question is about the other slide. Basically, you know, what are these dots? What are the blue and the green dots? So the green are the current system we have. You can interpret the blue dots as where we want to get to. Okay, so that's where you know where we are modeling, where we're hoping we get to. Right, so California being 50% is not saying California is operating at 50%, but saying an eventual goal is to get to 50%. Right, so these are some sort of the simulated system models we have given the target for renewable integration given the target for generation mix. So now where we are, we are, you know, continental US is quite bad, quite low in this graph, right? You know, other are higher, but all of this you have to sometimes interpret with a grain of thought, right? So now Denmark being, for example, 42% renewables is really because Denmark is connected to everything else in the in Europe. Okay, so Denmark basically there is using the European grid as this gen, giant backup battery. I think we can, you know, we can have a lot of renewables, but the everything else is backing me up. Right? So you know, saying them, so some of these numbers are because you're in a much larger system. 
Whereas Maui is a lot more solid, right? So Maui is 35% renewable because there's nothing connecting to that island, right? So it's really a 35% renewable system. Okay? So, you know, so this picture showing that, uh, you know, to get to 50% renewables for large power systems is, will be quite challenging for us. Okay. So another message in chat is we'll be covering demand side response. Uh, yes, so when we do storage, we'll talk about demand response in a similar context or treat it similar to demand response. Okay, so any more questions about this? Any more questions about this slide or other things? Okay, so if not, let's get into the details about power generation. So this is aerodynamics. So this is uh, mechanics, mechanical, mechanics about the uh, wind power generation. Yeah, wind power generation. So one reason we're doing wind power generation and not solar, right? So why are we concentrating on you know, how wind is generated? Why are we not covering how solar is generated, right? Given that you know, they appear as similar resources on the grid. As for wind power generation turns out to be easier, right? It's basically classical mechanics. All we need is things like half mv squared to get a good understanding of this. And for solar, we have to go into quantum mechanics, right? go to you know, a fair bit of materials to get a good understanding. So you know, the choice is to stick with classical mechanics and do one generation. And the, this has the added benefit of covering both machines and how power electronics is integrated with the machines. Okay, so we'll look at when power generation works. Then we'll look at how electronics is wrapped around this induction motor and synchronous machines. Okay, so these are, you know, so we're not doing solar because, not because it's not important, uh, because you know, we don't have enough prerequisite to really give a fair treatment. Whereas for wind, it's easier, you know, given the prerequisite we have, it's easier to treat wind. So for wind, obviously, you know, how much power you generate depends on the wind speed. Right? So it depends on the wind speed. The faster the speed is, the faster you can, you, you know, the more power you can generate. Yeah? So normally we're targeting this zone right? for obvious reasons. There, there's, there's no wind, then there's no power. Whereas if you go to too much wind, if you go to a sort of hurricane level wind, then really you run into stability issues with the turbine. Okay. So a wind turbine normally have an operating range. Okay. So below the minimum speed, nothing happens. Above the maximum speed, you have to uh, manually sh shut off the turbine. Okay, so it's not as if, you know, given the hurricane, you suddenly have a lot more wind power. Right? That's the turbines are designed with the operating range. So that's something to keep in mind. Right? It's not, you know, as speed increases, we keep generating more power. Okay? So speed definitely impact, right? So definitely impact the how much power we have. And the elevation is also another impact. So this 10 and 50, this is height. Okay? So these are, right? This is how high you are. So if you're 10 meters off the ground versus you're 50 meters off the ground, you have different power density. Right? So higher you are off the ground, you have more power. Right? You, have, you have higher speed. And hence higher speed, you have uh, more power. Okay? So the difference, so the higher is better because you, as you go away from the ground, you, there are less drag, there's less impact of the surface. So the wind speed is a lot higher. The wind is not slowed down by the surface. Okay, so you have higher speed, that's why you have higher power. Okay, so actually when you go up higher, the air density, right? So you have sort of small air density that reduces your power, but the increase in speed more than make up for that. Okay, so you have slightly lower density, then there's, there's less air you're pushing through. Right, they're just moving so much fast. They're moving much faster. Okay, so your trade-off is 
higher terabytes has more power. So that's the height and speed relationship. Right, so this is again a picture of showing you where the high wind are. Right, so you know offshore there's you know quite a bit power offshore, quite a bit power in the middle of the country. Right, and you do see a lot of big projects going on. There's a lot of projects both tapping into offshore wind and tapping into sort of wind in the middle of the continent. So the North America in the middle of the continent. There's quite a number of projects. Uh, going on. So let's look at some equations. So now we're going to look at equations. Most of this again is you know fairly simple classical mechanics, but serves to remind us of the uh, sort of as a reminder of the, the physics reminder. Okay. So the clinic, so the kinetic energy of a moving object. Right. So this is a Standard equation we all seen half mv squared. So this amount of energy we have in the moving object, m is of course a mass of the object, v is a speed. Okay. So this is the amount of kinetic energy I have. Okay. So how does this translate to what? Right. So how what basically what does m mean for what? How do we get the mass? when we translate things to wind power. So to go to wind, what we have is, you can think of a wind turbine as a region that the wind is passing through, right? So you have this region as really traced out by the turbine. Okay, so the turbine, they turn and they trace out a circular area. So they really trace out the circular area. So amount of kinetic energy we capture is amount of kinetic energy inside this circle. You have a circle of area A. These are where the wind turbines are spinning. So this we capture, I think of, you know, some of the kinetic energy inside this area. Okay. Capture some of these. So again, the equation is kinetic energy is have um, v squared. So, right, so the book, right, so the reference book, the wind energy book. Uh, so let's use this. So we use W. So we use W. So the book, again, this is a reference uses W. for speed. Okay, so we'll also use W here. Right, so normally you see V, but for notation reasons, W is often used in the book as well as in literature. Okay, so we'll use W as a stand for wind speed. Okay, so this wind speed. So we have this much uh, kinetic energy. So how do we translate this? How do we get rid of this mass term? Then? Right, this mass term is not some, it's not a good term for us to use. We don't want to compute the mass of air that's flowing through the wind turbine area. So how do we get rid of mass? Any suggestions? Right, so we really don't want to calculate mass. Uh, there are some equations that helps us to get rid of mass. Right, so James says in the chat, area times speed times density, right? So this comes from the fact that you can think of mass as volume times delta, right? Where delta is density of air, W is speed. So, right, so density is something we know. Right? Air density is a fairly constant number. So we can express mass as volume times density times delta. And then volume is again a easier quantity to work with because we're looking at airflow through an area. 
Okay, so how much volume? What is the volume of airflow through the area? Well, volume flow is how big the area is. How big, how A, how big the area is times how fast the wind is moving, right? Higher speed, higher volume, times how long we're looking at the how long we're to take a look at this, right? So the amount of volume of air flowing through has to do proportional with the area, the speed of wind, and the amount of time we're observing. Okay, so this is the volume. So A is the area, T is time, and T is time, right? So this is our volume. So if you look at mass, then it's easier to write mass as a times W times T times Delta. We want to express this into the following terms, right? And these are all good qualities we can measure, right? We know how big our wind turbine is. We know the air density. We can measure the wind speed, right? So all of these are, right? so we don't need to deal with mass. Right? So we can easily convert mass into a term that depends on the physical characteristics of the wind turbine. So then we have the kinetic energy of air, right? So then if we basically substitute all this thing, we have instead of half m, you know, mw squared, what we have is substitute whatever, so substitute what we have for m, we have half a delta omega times start delta W times T times W square. This is half A delta T times W cubed. Okay, this is cube of the speed, right? So this is an important term, right? This is energy roughly to the cube of speed. Okay, so which is quite high scaling. And this is quite high scale, right? So this is, for example, if you double the speed, you get eight times more power or eight times more energy out of this, right? So this says, you know, speed is really the main thing driving, main thing driving uh, how much power we can get, right? So that's why, you know, we're willing to go to very, you know, inconvenient areas, you know, area that build turbine that's over, let's say, our mountain, things like this. It's because we, any increasing speed uh, means a lot of, you know, small increasing speed means a big increase in power or big increase in the kinetic energy of air, right? So this cubic relationship is important. Right? It's important, right? So, right, so this is cubed. This is, that's why we want to build things high, right? So we want to build, you know, any time we can squeeze more speed, right? Anytime we can increase the speed of the turbine, we, we are willing to do it, okay? We, should, we are willing to do it, right? So that's why an offshore has a lot of higher speed, whereas inside the city, uh, it's fairly low speed, okay? It's fairly low speed because you have a lot of friction if you have a lot of buildings. We have quite a bit of friction when you have buildings. So although there are people, there are startups looking at, you know, we have buildings, our average, the speed is lower, but sometimes you have funnels through buildings, like there's through some buildings you have, one tends to funnel through some buildings that had to create a high speed. So there are startups looking at you know, capturing energy in this for very specific locations. But anyway, so the speed is a number one uh, factor for how much power you produce, right? Because of cubic relationship, because of cubic relationship. So the next term, if you look at this, there's a density term, right? So speed is cubed, density also shows up. And density, of course, depend on the height, right? Depend on the height of the, where you are, okay? depend on the height where you are, right? So the higher you go, the lower the density, right? So lower the density, so well, that impacts the power a little bit but definitely not much as much as the speed. So 
there are formulas, right? There are formulas to calculate density. These are empirical formulas. Uh, there's not much to say about these formulas, except you know you should know where they are. Okay, so in the homework or in the in the exams, you'll see a question says, you know, the height is 10 meters, compute the power. Right, so the height is 10 meters, the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, compute the power. Right, so these are questions you may face. Then all you need to know is where to find these equations. Right, so we're not, these are just you know, fitted equations we have for density. Right, so we have one equation that has to do with the height, right, where you are, the elevation, where you are. Then we'll have another equation that has to do with the pressure. Okay, so there are pressures. So sometimes it's easier to measure height, sometimes it's easier to measure pressure. So we have two different formulas. But there's not much to say. Uh, beyond, you know, just knowing the, knowing these equations are here and uh, finding them. Okay. So any questions so far about the kinetic energy or the equation for density? Okay, all right, so you should know how to, you know, Know where to find the equations, right? Know it showed up in this lecture, in this slides. Uh, look at the, the units, right? So the one thing is, for example, the temperature units. Right? So, so this is just temperature in Celsius, right? So make sure you have the right units and so on. Otherwise, just apply the formulas, right? just apply the formulas. So other than that, let's look at something called air power density or wind power density. Okay, so remember what we did is we got to this as energy, right? This is energy. Whereas often we want to talk about power. Okay, it's often power as a more natural unit because energy has to do with how long you're looking at this turbine, right? where power is sort of more intrinsic measure of how much uh, wind is there, right? So then to get from energy to power is quite simple. So we just take this divide by T. Right? This is sort of quite simple to conversion. And we just divide T away. So this is half A delta W to the third. So this is the one power. And if you look at this power, this has the factor of A inside of it, right? So A is how big our turbine is, how much, you know, what, what is a circular area we trace out with the turbine. So if we want to get rid of this A, then we have something called rho, right? Rho is the power density. which has a unit of watt per meter squared. So this rho is just amount of power we have divided by the area over which we're capturing this power. So this is half delta W cubed, right? So again, the important thing to remember is this is proportional to the cube of the speed. Any question about this? Okay, so the thing to remember here is to get the terminology correct. Right, so often you see a question asking the power or the power density. Right, so it's important to remember which is which. Right, so power has a unit of watt. Power density have a unit of watt per meter square. All right, so the reason we have per meter square as we're looking at through an area. Right? So it's uh, important to remember the units on this kind of things. All right, so we have power density. Again, this right, cubic relation says the curve goes up really quickly. Uh, this cannot be emphasized enough that the this power density really, really depends on the speed of the wind. Okay, really, really depends on the speed of wind, right? So, 
So again, so if double, speed leads to a times power, right? Top a times power. And basically again, right? So one hour of 20 miles per hour when this is equal to eight hours of 10 mile per hour wind, right? So again, quite a bit more, right? So this cubic relationship says, you know, the scaling is quite fast with speed, okay? quite fast with speed. Okay? So now your homework, you'll see some question where the speed just increased, let's say by 50%, where the power went up by a factor of, let's say four, right? Which that's, that's not a surprise. Okay? So this gives the idea what it is. All right, so, right, so this is basically the power density, right? This rho is about nature, right? This power, when power density is what nature gives you, and just how fast the area is going at a particular location. Then what engineering, what we decide, what we decide is a, right? What we decide is the size of the blade. Right, so the power is proportional to the area and the area is basically proportional to the square of the blade length, right? So if you have a turbine, again, this is my drawing of the blades on a wind turbine. So this is a turbine. And let's say this is R, then area is of course, you know, proportional to R square. So this is again, why we want to build large turbines, right? One is, is higher up in the ground, which means we have access to faster speed of wind. And then because it's, you know, we can have larger, longer blades, we capture more area, right? Which has a, so the area has a square relationship versus the, how long the blade is, right? So incentive is really to build large turbines. Right, tall turbines and with large blades. Just because there is how this power comes out to be, how the scaling of the power comes out to be. All right, so any questions about this? I have a question. Does sure. the length of the blade limit how fast they can spin? Uh, yes, but the rate of rotation normally doesn't enter into the power you generate. Okay. Right, so you can have a slow spin rate, but you can still generate you know, quite a bit of power just because you have larger blades. Okay, so do, they, so do they operate at lower wind speeds? No, they operate at higher wind speed. So they want to attack, take advantage of high wind speed. Okay. So you have high wind speed, but the rate of rotation may be lower. But oh. Yeah, so this is a good question because it actually says if you have a very large wind turbine, we need to use a synchronous machine. Because when you have very large wind turbines, the speed, it's hard to set a synchronous speed for induction machine. It's hard to external, you know, have an external speed. But that's why for very large turbines, we get to, let's say two megawatt or one megawatt. You really have synchronous machines because you want to allow all kinds of spin rate, right? So sp speeds basically for the machine, right? So that's where it comes in. Okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, so that's a good question. Any other questions about this? Um, yeah, so yeah. The, uh, the, is there like a threshold then basically for when you'd want to use synchronous versus induction? Right, so, a lot of the new turbines are synchronous machines. I will say maybe even most of them are synchronous machines. Uh, the difference between synchronous induction is induction tends to be a little bit cheaper and induction machines, uh, you don't need as much power electronics around as synchronous machines. So, you, so a, a lot of, a lot of sort of the wind turbines out there already built 
are so-called type three, which is basically induction machine with something, you know, with things around it. That's induction machines that's sort of easier to build at that type. Now this was newer technologies, almost all synchronous. So very few induction, we'll see very few inductions machines. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so if you go out and buy a wind turbine, it's probably a synchronous machine. However, if you go out to work and you have to deal with wind turbines, you, know, you have to deal with turbine that's already installed and a lot of those will be induction. Right? So we will learn both, we'll learn both in this class. Right, so any other questions for this? Okay, so let's do a simple exercise, right? So not everything in the class will be this easy, but let's do a simple exercise. So let's say we have, you know, wind energy in an area that's one meter squared. Let's see how much energy we generate. But really this is looking at, you know, how speed comes into it, right? So we have same area, same number of hours, different speed, how much energy do we generate? So this is really easy, right? So we plug into the equation. We have kinetic energy as half a delta P cube of the speed, W cube. So here assume delta is one. We're gonna assume the air has a one kilogram per meter cube. We'll assume it has this, Air density is fairly close to this. So let's, we'll make this assumption. So then here we have basically, if you have a four meter per second wind, we have something that's one, five, four cubed, something that's 0.16 kilowatt hour, so not a lot, cannot, uh, not enough to power your home. Or you go to, let's say, eight, right? I double the speed. This is 1.28 kilowatt hour. So this is definitely enough to power, to power your home. Okay. Now, if you just increase this by a little bit, to nine meters per second, you get 1.822 kilowatt per hour, okay? So again, going from eight to nine does make a difference. Okay, you got quite a bit more, you got 50% more by power by just going from eight to nine. Okay? So you're very sensitive to speed, right? So if you, so again, as I said, for the folks, you know, there are some startups that try to build sort of the wind turbines in cities or other areas, the key is really to figure out where you have fast wood. Right? You want to target where you have fast wood. Whatever, you know, a little bit increasing in speed, right? From eight to nine, gets you a lot more in power. Okay? So these are important things, right? So, right, so what impacts speed, right? So what, what impacts speed? Well, so what impacts speed is basically so to get a rough rule of thumb in how we think about speed, we'll think about this in the following way. Okay? Because when we measure wind speed, we cannot measure wind speed at every elevation, right? at every height possible. So what we normally do is we'll have a reference. This is we measure speed W0 at height H zero, okay? So we measure this one speed at this height. Then we want to see as you go higher and lower, right? As I go higher and lower, how does the speed change right? with respect to the reference speed? Okay, so we have a proportional relationship. Right? So we have basically this kind of power law relationship, okay, governing how speed changes, right? So H is how high you are. H not at some reference height, or the reference height is normally 100 meters, okay? And they're related through this coefficient, through this coefficient, right? So, 
alpha is like a drag coefficient or a you know, friction coefficient that takes a bunch of values and these are some measure values. So now, right, you may see a question that says, we're operating a turbine over open terrain. We have measured the speed at 100 meters to be 10 meters per second. What is the speed at 50 meters? Right, then you can use this type of equations to answer that question. Right, so, so again, this is avoiding us having to measure speed at every possible elevation. Right, we measure at a few elevations, we can use this kind of equation to figure it out. All right, so this is called you know, elevation and Earth's roughness is because this alpha changes from different terrains, right? So and the water is really good, right? Calm water is for really, really flat, not much drag. Whereas a large city gives you a lot of drag. A large city tends to have quite a bit of drag for wind. Right, so this has also idea you know, where you should build wind, right? How the best you want, you know, high speed or a very flat area. That's where you want to build wind turbines. Right, so then you know, we can convert the speed relationship to power relationship, right? Power is speed cubed. So if you measure the amount of one power available at a reference height, then the power at another height is given by a factor of three alpha. Right, the three comes from the cubic relationship between speed. Okay. Any questions about these equations? How do they calculate alpha? Uh, so this is empirical measurement. So you take Let's say you go to one city, you take a bunch of measurements, you fit alpha. Then this is in the data sheet. So we can, people look up. And is there a large difference between like, so I understand how a city and like a prairie right. would have different alphas, right. but is there like a discernible difference between like a prairie and foothills? Um, or do you just do it every time you build something somewhere? Uh, so this alpha is normally used as a ballpark calculation. So let's say uh, you're proposing to build wind turbines over an area. Then you look up this area, let's say it's you know, foothill or prairie. You say, okay, this around, you, know, you pick alpha is 1.4. You do some calculations, you figure out if they're feasible or not, right? Does it make sense? Then you go to more detailed measurements for that specific location. So this is a design tool for us, right? So, you know, since this, this is actually quite uh, sensitive to this alpha, right? 1.4 and 0.4 makes a big difference. So this helps uh, engineers to decide whether it makes sense or not to do more investigation in that one area. Okay, thank you. Right, okay, so let's do one example on this. Okay, that's one example. So this is a typical example, right? So what we, we or we, we do typically is, oh, so chat question. Can we just put wind turbines on top of skyscrapers? Uh, no, right? So one is sky, the top of skyscrapers, there's wind, but there's actually a bit of drag. Okay, so if you are not on that skyscraper, it's actually more, the wind speed is higher. Also the roof of a building is very important to the building. Okay, the roof of the building typically houses a lot of the HVAC equipment. Okay, so it's not something you want to mess around with or put a wind turbine in. So that's hard to do, putting on the roof of a building. That being said, if you have a lot of skyscrapers, for example, you know, Chicago is famous for being like this, as there are some corridors, you know, it's very windy, right? Famously, you know, Chicago or NYC, there are sort of very windy places you have. And then the goal is to figure out, you know, you can place turbines there, right? but normally not on top, not big turbines. You may place a little one, but not big turbines. Yeah. Uh, yeah, top of the building actually is quite uh, interesting. So, so for people who have not seen the top of buildings, it's interesting to take a look, see all, all the equipment on top of buildings. So, yeah, so 
in a city, there's some microclimates, but uh, it's actually quite interesting. There's a number of startups trying to do this, where to put small wind turbines inside cities. So for us, we're not going to do that because we have no equation for it. So here, let's do an example of sort of how do we use the equation we have. As, right, so this problem says, OK, we measure the wind power density at 100 meters, so at the height of 100 meters, to be 2.5 kilowatt per meter squared. We measure this wind power density to be this one. We want to compute the wind power density at, the, at 50 meters in open terrain, right? This says it's flat land. We want to know if I reduce the, if I reduce the height by half, how much wind power density I have. So it turns out for this kind of question, this, we just need to use this proportional relationship right? because the ratio between power is the same as wind power density compared to the reference power, which if you look at this as you know, H by H naught, H by H zero, three alpha, Okay, so we know so rho is the reference times this is 2.5, 50 over 100, 3 times alpha. We can look up alpha as 0 0.143. And this we get 1.86 kilowatt per meter square. So this is not so bad. It's not so bad for wind density. Okay. So, all right, so alpha plays this row, right? Alpha plays basically this sort of scaling row that we have. Okay. All right. So for the value of alpha, if it ever appears on the exam or homework, we'll either tell you what alpha is or will be one of those three. Okay, so we may say open terrain, we'll say large city, we'll say calm water. Then you expect to find these three alphas or we'll tell you what alpha is. So these are sort of the way alpha can appear in a homework on the midterm exam. Any questions about this calculations? Okay, all right, so uh, let's stop here today because next we're going to airfoils. Basically, how does airplanes work? So that may be better to do it all together in the next lecture. So I'll see, uh, so if you have no questions, I'll see you on Thursday. I will post a homework and uh, this week's homework will have it due next Wednesday. Okay, so I'll post homework tomorrow and I'll do the Wednesday afterwards. All right, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have a question if you're sure, answering that for really. Yeah. Um, and this is probably not a good question, but what's the, in the beginning of the class, you said that uh, everyone who's taking this class was already probably convinced that renewable energies is a good thing. Right. Uh, how do I, and then I guess the, the question is, how do I convince myself of that um, when later, like the next topic afterwards was how our nation's GDP had fallen by like 30% or something like that in one quarter, yet this continues to expand, or this is an area that continues to grow regardless. Right. Um, so if you think about it in like an economic terms, like how do I convince myself that it's not just a way of like funneling? Right, we're not just money. making money out of this, right? So yeah, it's exactly. different than Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Another question, right? Bitcoin also grows by I don't know, hundred percent. Right? Why is this different than Bitcoin? Right. Right. So, <laughs> right, so we can frame the question in that way, right? So one is. So renewable energy is one is sort of necessary in some sense, right? So if you look at California, for example, right, there are fires they had and they had to cut power to 
big chunk of Bay Area, things like this. That's really driven by climate change. Right? I don't think there's debate or scientific debate about that. Right? So, you know, that's, that's true. And to deal with that is fundamentally, so the short-term solution is we need to manage the power system better. For the intermediate and longer term solution is we need to make the system more cleaner, right? We need a cleaner, we need to reduce the carbon emissions, right? So that's the longer term solution. So the societal need is there. This is the societal need is there. Societal need is to uh, get a more sustainable energy system. So that's definitely there. So the so of course societal need doesn't, you know, may not drive the markets, right? So what is having this growth, right? So it turns out we're at a good place in technology that we can do a lot of things like install solar panels. Okay, so if you look at solar panel installation, that's an area with very high growth rate. So many, many people are putting solar panels on their roofs. Right? So that's, so be, this clean energy, this clean tech sector expanding, a lot is because this sort of physical assets can be put in, you know, into the actual grid, into actual utility grid. They're similar with storage. Uh, similar with storage. So these are all the new things that's coming into the grid that's driving this growth. So, and uh, you have, you know, in California, you have people, you, know, you have madness about all new vehicles, new electric vehicles. In Seattle, you know, we have proposals at least about new buildings must be electrically heated or electrically cooled. Uh, so these are, so the growth I think is not driven by people want to park money somewhere. It's really sort of this, this tangible things happening on the ground. And these tangible things are making the system more sustainable. Right? Moving, you know, gas power cars to uh, electric vehicles is better for the environment. It's you know less carbon emissions for sure. So I think that's why you know this growth being robust. That's maybe different than you know people just parking money. Uh, this is there's tangible things that's happening, and there's you know good short term gains, right? If you build a solar panel on your house, there are good short good short term gains, maybe you know more selfish gains. There are also you know gains for the environment for longer term societal gains. So I think that's you know, where I would say it's there, we're making the right investment in some sense. Right? All right, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Hi, yes. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, I was just, I'm in the seminar class. 